I learned something from that. Never sit on an egg. (laughs) Exactly, you might be surprised at what gets hatched. We're continuing our look at the fruit of the Spirit today. And I can honestly say, um, in preparation for today, uh, that this area of God working in our lives is one that um, is perhaps the most needed um, of all of them in terms of just practical, uh, day-to-day living out of the Christian life. Uh, We are reminded in Galatians 5, where we've been looking every week at the list of the fruit of the Spirit. Paul says there in Galatians 5.22, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. We've looked at all those today, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. The idea of faithfulness, the idea that that God wants us as his people by his working within us to be faithful is is a difficult concept for many of us. It's the idea of dependability, of reliability. Uh, Many of you uh, probably uh, have have stories of people in your life uh, that you thought would be faithful and they were not. Faithfulness is a tough, tough area. And unfortunately, it's an attribute that is sorely lacking amongst many Christians even uh, today, the idea of being faithful, uh, being faithful in all circumstances. Uh, This idea of faithfulness, uh, we, we could say that we are a faithful person, but faithfulness must have an object. It must have something to which we can be Faithful. It has to be directed toward someone or something. We can't just say, oh, I'm a faithful person and never have to show faithfulness in any circumstance in our life. Faithfulness is something that is, that is lived out. Just like patience and kindness and goodness. All of these things we can say uh, we possess. That we can say, oh yeah, I'm a patient person, but then we're impatient in circumstances where we need to be patient. It's the same with faithfulness. We can say, and I'm sure all of us want to be called faithful. I, I have met people before who say they are faithful people, and yet when uh, it comes out at the end of the day, they weren't very faithful in whatever commitment they had made with their life. So faithfulness is an attribute that is so necessary for us today. Um, and so today I want us to look, as we look at this issue of faithfulness, at three dimensions of faithfulness. Uh, I want us to see an example of faithfulness, and then I want us to see how faithfulness uh, is, is kind of lived out in our lives. And, and it's, it's going to be a very practical, um, you know, I, I may step on some toes, and, and I'm sorry. I wear a size 13, and if, if you're right there, I may step on it. I'm sorry. Uh, because I know when, when I was preparing this today, God kind of kind of took me to the mat on some stuff and, and showed some areas in my life that, that he wants me to, uh, to, to turn over to him. And so... So so there are three dimensions of faithfulness. The first dimension of faithfulness that is so important, we start here, is faithfulness from God. We need to know what faithfulness actually looks like. We need to know that faithfulness is not just something uh, that, that is... Uh, defined by worldly standards. We need to know what true faithfulness is. And faithfulness is one of the core attributes of God. Scripture over and over and over again reminds us that God is faithful. Uh, Just to give you a few examples, Psalm 86, 15 But you, O Lord, are a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Uh, Lamentations 3, 22 and 3 and 23, we actually sang part of these verses earlier today. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Now, if you know anything about Lamentations, that is the saddest book in the entire Bible. I mean, it is just, if you suffer from periods of depression, 
Lamentations will not help you get out of that depression. It is a sad, sad book. But right in the middle of it is this great affirmation of the tremendous faithfulness of God. Deuteronomy 7, 9 tells us too. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. God is faithful. In fact, he is so faithful that if he stopped being faithful, he would stop being God. 2 Timothy 2.13 tells us, and this is, this is good news for me, if we are faithless, are we sometimes faithless? Not faithful like we ought to be? If we are faithless, he, that is God, remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. There are certain things that God can't do. I know that sounds strange to say, but it's true. God cannot do something that by doing it would make him cease to be God. And if God stopped being faithful, he would stop being God, because God cannot deny himself. God is faithful. It means God is utterly faithful. Dependable. It means we can rest in the assurance that God will not change, that God will not forget His promises, that He will not abandon His people. We can rest in that truth that even when we are faithless, He is faithful. That is ultimately our only hope. See, if it depended on on us, if God's care and concern for us depended upon on how well we performed, we would be in serious trouble. Because God is not a boss in the sense, you know, if you have a job, if you don't perform to the standards that you were hired to perform for, what do they do? They fire you. God is not our boss. He's not going to look at us and say, you know what, you really didn't do well this week, so I'm going to be done with you for a while, I'm going to get rid of you, and see if you learned your lesson. That's not how God operates. God is utterly faithful. God's not a boss, instead God is a father. You know, there are times when I was growing up that I disappointed my parents. There were things that I did, there were things that I said, there were attitudes that I had that made my parents just look at me and say, how in the world is that coming from you? And there were times that my performance was not what they wanted, but they never once stopped being my parents. In the same way, God is our Father. If we've come and given our lives completely and totally to Him, He is our Father. And there is nothing we can do that will make Him stop being our Father because He is utterly and completely faithful. God is faithful. It's difficult for us to describe in human language. We, we don't really have a concept that, that grasps this idea of that kind of, of extreme faithfulness. And if you notice in those passages we looked at just a minute ago from the Old Testament, the Deuteronomy passage, the, the Psalm passage, the, you, you see this phrase, steadfast love, that's often connected with the idea of faithfulness. The Hebrew word that is translated, uh, steadfast love, other places it's translated just love, other places loyalty, um, is the word hesed. It's a beautiful word in Hebrew. Um, It's really not adequate to translate it as anything. It's the idea of complete and total commitment. That God is so committed to his people that there is nothing that would stop that commitment from being there. Now, I hear a lot of people critique some contemporary music for being repetitive. And I I understand that critique. But you realize that is a biblical concept. You don't believe me? Turn in your Bible at some point, maybe when you get home, to Psalm 136. Okay, Psalm 136 is a worshipful retelling of God's dealing with his people. And every other line is, for his steadfast love endures forever. 
over and over and over and over again. Why? Because we need to be reminded that God's faithfulness is so totally different from anything we can experience in human relationships. His steadfast love endures forever. His faithfulness, His commitment to us endures forever. So in that psalm, they retell God's story of His faithfulness in creation and their rescue from Egypt and His provision for His people. So we see faithfulness from God. We have to start there if we're going to understand true biblical faithfulness. But then we need to see that there's faithfulness to God. Faithfulness from God and faithfulness to God. Matthew 24, 12 through 13 is a powerful passage. Jesus is talking about the, the, the time when he returns and what's going to take place before that. And he says, because lawless, lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. What does Jesus say will take place? In that passage of Scripture, what does Jesus say will happen? He says lawlessness will be increased. There will be an increase of lawlessness. So what is lawlessness? It is a utter disregard for God. It's a disregard for what God desires, for what pleases God, and for what God commands. You know, think about it. You break the law. What happens when you break the law? You disregard the law. You don't care about what the law says. So you're going to do what you want to do. That's lawlessness. It's just doing whatever you desire, not what God says. An increase in lawlessness will then lead to an increase in cold love. The love of many will grow cold. So the question we have to ask ourselves is, how do we know if we have a lawless heart or not? And here is a simple question, a simple test that you can give yourself. I don't suggest you give it to other people. This is an individual, you you and God. If you do it to other people, they might fuss at you or hit you with something. Um, But it's a question to ask yourself, and that is, for what do I make excuses? For what do I make excuses? Think about that. Think about that for just a second. What is something that is clearly laid out as right or wrong and we make excuses for why it does not apply to us? Or why we don't have to abide by that? See, when we have that kind of attitude of, well, well, you know, it's, you know, I don't don't have to, you know, we, we make these excuses, I don't have to do this, I don't have to say that or whatever, we begin to increase lawlessness in our own heart. Because what happens is we begin to excuse one thing, we'll start excusing other things. And because of that, there becomes a lack of love. See, love is not just a feeling. Love is a commitment. Love is a commitment. Now, now, now just, let's, let's extend this argument to, to husbands and wives for a second. What if I excused um, faithfulness to Kristen? To say, you know what, um, I, I, don't, I don't really have to be 100% faithful. I can be 95% faithful to her. And, and I'm, I'm enough faithful to her that that 5% doesn't matter. What do you think Kristen would say to, to that? Like, honey, I've been faithful to you 95% of the time. What do you think she would say to that? She'd probably say, hit the road, Jack as she throws all kinds of stuff at me. See, we, we, we think, we realize that's not okay. And yet when it comes to God, we think, you know what? I've been faithful to God most of the time. This little bit of lack of faithfulness, that's, that's okay. When we start excusing it, when we start excusing our own lawless behavior, we begin to go down a path that leads us to less and less love because true love is always faithful love. 
And if we love God, if we love Jesus, then we will be faithful to Him. See, the answer to this kind of increase in faithlessness that happens, as lawlessness in our heart increases, as our love grows cold, the answer to that is radical countercultural faithfulness to God. That's why Jesus says there in verse 13, the one who endures to the end will be saved. The one who endures, the one who stays faithful. It's not a question of how you feel on a particular day. It's a question of your faithfulness to God. But now, We've got to remember, this is not a nose-to-grindstone, rigid, unloving commitment. This is not saying, okay, God, you, I, I'm, going to be, I'm not going to like it, but I'm going to be faithful. You know, we, we have, uh, Sophie's at that age now where we've started telling her some chores she has to do. And, uh, the other day she was telling some folks that, that we make her do all the chores, and she doesn't have any time to play anymore. And she was like, I have to feed the dog, and I have to empty the dishwasher, and I have to, you know, make my bed, and I have to put my... I mean, she was just going off this long list of stuff that we ask her to do as part of our family. It's just a natural, you know, part of being part of the Thomas family. There's just stuff you got to do. And she was like, I don't want to do it. And then when we ask her to do it, she sometimes don't want to do it, and she does it. And she doesn't do it willingly. That's not the kind of commitment I'm talking about. The kind of commitment that I'm talking about with God is not, well, God, if I don't do it, you're going to get me, so I better do it. That's not the kind of commitment I'm talking about. What I'm talking about and what Scripture talks about is a freeing surrender of all of our lives to Jesus, knowing that faithfulness to Him is the only hope we have for the future. See, the truth is, God is going to be victorious. I've read the back of the book, and God wins. And I want to be on God's winning side. Now, I could decide I'm going to do this grudgingly and miss out on all the joy that God offers. Or I can freely give my life to Him and say, Okay, God, I'm giving you my life. Every part of it, every aspect of who I am is yours. I'm 100% bought in. I'm, I'm all yours. God, do with me as you will. And then God blesses that kind of surrender and that kind of faithfulness. Heaven help us when we make serving God only about when it's convenient for us. When being committed to God becomes an inconvenience to us, there's a problem with our heart that we need to do business with God about. I meet people all the time that they talk about how, you know, well, it's just, you know, it's just not convenient for me to do this. It's not, it's not in my schedule right now. You know what that tells me? You've got a God that's not the real God. You've made an idol out of whatever it is you're doing that's taking your time. Whether it's your job, whether it's your family, whether it's your career path going up the ladder, whatever it might be, you've made something else your God and not the real true living God because if we are committed to God, it shows in our lives. The direct consequence when we recognize God's faithfulness to us. Faithfulness from God leads to faithfulness to God. And then thirdly, faithfulness to God's work. How do we show that we are faithful to God? You know, if I were to ask by raising, raising and I'm not going to do this, but if I were to say, everybody raise your hand who wants to be faithful to God today, I would hope I'd get 100% participation. Okay? If not, come talk to me afterwards. But the point is, is that we can all say, yeah, I want to be faithful to God. Yeah, I want, I want to be faithful and yet we don't know how to show it. So how do we show it? It's by being faithful to the things that God cares about, to the work of God. And what is God doing in our world today? He's doing the same thing he was doing for several thousand years, and that is he's building a people for himself. He's working to redeem a people for himself, for his glory. In other words, he's building a church. 
And if you read the book of Revelation, several places in the book of Revelation, it speaks of the great multitude around the throne of God. That is God's ultimate finished work, is all believers of all ages, of every ethnicity, every tribe, tongue, people, and language coming together around the throne of God to worship. That's what God is doing. And we need to be committed to what God is committed to. And God is committed to building a church. Hear what Paul says in 1 Corinthians. You may be familiar with these verses, and I want you to hear them with fresh ears today. He says there in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, beginning at verse 5, What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed is the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he knew plants, nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him, for God's temple is holy and you are that temple. Now before I give any explanation on this passage, I want want to tell you to do something on the outline. Anytime it says... You are God's building, you are God's temple, the Spirit of God dwells in you. Make sure you realize that is you, plural. You could say y'all. Okay, we Southerners have a word for that. It's y'all. Okay, y'all are God's temple. This is not individualistic Christianity. This is church. Paul's talking to the church in Corinth about this as a communal activity. And he's making a very powerful point that we need to see here. And that is you and I are given one life. You and I are given one life to live for the glory of God. And we are called to do things with the life that we are given. And we are to build something with that life. Now what are we to build? We're not to build our life. That's not the context of what Paul's talking about there. Who is the building of God? It's the people of God. It's the church. The foundation is Jesus. The church is built upon that foundation. So we need to understand that that we have a role to play in God's church. Paul planted Apollos. They, They did different things. They had different tasks. We're all different We all have different responsibilities, but we're all valuable parts of the body that God is building, the building that God is building. We belong to God. Therefore, God can use us however He sees fit. When I was uh, right out of college, I went on a mission trip to Bolivia. Those of you who know me know that construction is not my forte. And one of the things that we were called uh, on our trip to do was to help build uh, an addition onto a church building. And it was a brick building. And so some of us were uh, to help actually lay the brick. And some of us were to shovel the sand to mix the mortar. Now, let me ask you, who was more important in that job? The people who actually laid the brick or the people who helped mix the mortar? Neither. Both had different jobs, but they were both necessary. 
The bricklayers were the ones that did the visible work, but the people hauling sand, the people hauling water, the people mixing the mortar were just as important. In the same way, we belong to God, and God can use us for whatever task he sees fit. Don't think for a second you are not valuable to the work that God is doing in building his church. God has a role for every single person. We're just called to be faithful in it. If you go just a few verses later in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul says, For a steward is required to be found faithful. That's success biblically. We need to know our role and we need to commit to the mission that God has given to us. Our individual labors are part of the bigger picture. God is building a church. His people for His glory. Not for my glory, not for your glory, for His glory. And as a result, we need to be committed and faithful to that. But we also need to build appropriately. We're building, but we can build with different materials. If you go back and look, he he talks about the different materials you could use. Some use gold, silver, precious stones. Others use wood, hay, or straw. There's different materials. To the life that we've been given, we've been given opportunities and resources to use for the purpose uh, of doing the work God's called for us, of building His people, building each other up. Not a physical building, a spiritual building of people. And we have a choice to make. We can either do it with the best, or we can do it with what's left. It's not a question of salvation. Paul says you build on the foundation. As long as the foundation is right, you will be saved. But what you built will be burned up. You have a choice to make choice is this. Are you going to build with the best that God has given you? Your best of your time, your best of your talents, the best of your efforts? Or are you going to build with what's left over after everybody else has taken their share? And then you give a little bit because you just feel like you have to. Yes, something will be built, but at the end of the day, what is built will be destroyed because it wasn't built to last. So don't give God your leftovers. Give him the best because he's given you his best. If Jesus loved his church enough to die for it, we should love the church enough to give our lives in faithful service to her. See, it's not a question of salvation. You know, if you've given your life to Jesus, you're going to go to heaven when you die. It's a question of what do you do with the life God's given you. And there's only one thing that will last through all eternity that we can build and we can contribute to, and that is the church of Jesus Christ. The church will last. It has one foundation, Jesus Christ, and in faithfulness we build upon it. So how can we do that? This is not on your outline, but if you want to write this down, three things for you and I to do that I think are very helpful. The first is faithfulness and attendance. Now, it's ironic that I'm saying this in the middle of summer. We're in the middle of the summer slump, and everybody needs a vacation. We're going on vacation this week. Everybody needs a vacation. I'm not knocking vacations. Okay, Everybody needs some time off. Uh, Don't take a vacation from church. If you go out of town for your vacation, if you've not taken your vacation yet, if you're out of town on a Sunday, go to church. Um, if nothing else, you'll get to see how other people do it and to make you appreciate what you have here. Um, hopefully, that's the point. Make you appreciate what you have here. Um, but be faithful in attendance. I, I read a news article several years ago that has stuck with me. It was a story of a, of a small village in Russia that, that a church building just disappeared. Just disappeared. And nobody knew why. Until they went and realized that what had happened was, is over the course of several years, brick by brick, very imperceptibly, very much unnoticed, people had been taking bricks from the building and selling them for a few pennies here or there, and nobody noticed because the building wasn't being used. And before long, when they went to actually show up to use the building, there was no building there because it had slowly but surely been dismantled brick by brick by brick. 
Now, that, that'll preach. Because here's the thing. Each one of us is here. I jokingly tell people, I say, you know, everybody gets a Sunday off every now and again. Um, and two Sundays off, I can understand. But three Sundays off, you get put on my list. Okay? Um, as to, you know, I won't know what's going on. You know, if it's health-related, I want to know so we can pray about it. If there's something else, we need to know. So don't get on my list, okay? Um, don't be one of these bricks that just disappears and nobody knows what happened. Faithfulness in attendance. Faithfulness in service. Don't just show up. Do something. Okay? Don't just show up. Showing up is the first step. You've got to get here. You've got to be part of the gathering of God's people. Uh, we don't go to church. The church gathers. Okay, because you and I are the church. Be faithful in service. Find an area of service. Um, and I'm not talking about just a job to do. Find somewhere that you can use the talents, the passions, the gifts, the abilities, the opportunities that God has given you to be utilized. And maybe there's not a ministry yet, but you see a need and God can use you to start a ministry to do great things for Him. Get involved with a Sunday school class, with a small group of some sort, with a group of brothers and sisters getting together to regularly study God's Word of whatever kind, and find an area of service. Be committed and faithful in service, and also be faithful in living outside the meeting of the church. What we do here is just the beginning of our service for Jesus. We then go, we then take what we've experienced here and we go outside the four walls of this building and we live it out. The life that we live is a testimony to the love that we have for Jesus Christ. So God is calling his people to be faithful. God has been faithful to us. He's calling us to be faithful to him. And he wants us to display that faithfulness wherever we go. The fruit of the Spirit is faithfulness. Which means it's not something that we do. It's not that we work harder. God brings faithfulness, but God puts us in circumstances where we have to discipline our muscles of faithfulness. You know, if you make a commitment to God today that you're going to be more faithful to Him, you will find this week things challenging you on a regular basis that have never challenged you before in terms of faithfulness. God puts us in situations where we can, can stretch our muscles of faithfulness. So make a commitment today. Make a commitment to take the next step in your journey of faithfulness. And maybe that's commitment to God to begin with. Maybe you've never fully and completely given your heart and life to Jesus Christ. Maybe you need a fresh start. Maybe you've had a lot of stuff going on. You've let stuff get in the way of your commitment to Him. Get, get a fresh start today. Or maybe you need to follow through in obedience to him in some area. Maybe it's baptism, maybe it's church membership, maybe it's, it's being committed to a Sunday school class, whatever it may be, the next step of obedience. Make a commitment to be faithful today. God's work is seen in your life. The fruit of the Spirit, one of the evidences that you are his child, is seen in faithfulness. Faithfulness to him and faithfulness to his work the church. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you so much for your word today, and I pray whatever our next step may be, wherever we find ourselves, whatever, whatever we need to do, Father, I pray that you would, would show us and stir us up to do what would please you as your people. Father, help us to be faithful to you because you have been faithful to us far more than we could ever begin to imagine. When we are faithless, Father, you are faithful. Help us, Father, to be faithful to what you value, to your people, the church. Lord, I pray that if there's one here that's struggling with where to step next in obedience, that we would follow through. Honestly, faithfully, in obedience to you. Because we love you, Father. Because you've done so much for us. Lord, we pray right now that you'd speak to our hearts through your Holy Spirit. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Stand with me, please, as we sing our hymn of response. <laughs>
being here today, and I pray that as we go, uh, that we will live in faithfulness uh, to the one who has been so faithful to us, even when we aren't faithful to him. I know the struggles and the difficulties that we go through in life. Uh, Always remember this, that he is faithful uh, through it all. He will see us through it, uh, no matter what you're going through, and uh, God is good. And so as we close today, uh, let's close by singing our chorus, uh, The Bond of Love.